least to stay out of our way and your house to try to put it Uh, good morning and welcome to the University of Washington. I'm Jerry Baldesty. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice President of the University. And I want to thank you for being here today. President Anamari Kause of the University cares deeply about the issues that will be discussed here today, and she regrets that she's unable to be here to participate. I want to welcome our many guests, those of you in the audience, and, and especially the Danish Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Danish Ambassador to the United States the embassy staff, uh, and our distinguished panelists. We're especially honored to, to welcome Her Royal Highness, the Crown Princess of Denmark, a distinguished representative of Denmark and of the Danish Royal House. It has been 42 years since Her Majesty, the Queen of Denmark, visited the University of Washington. And we send to her our warmest regards and our sincere condolences on the recent passing of the Prince Consort of Denmark. The University of Washington, the Danish Ministry of Education and Research, and Danish institutions of higher education have long-standing ties. Some of the universities with whom the University of Washington works includes the University of Copenhagen, Aarhus University, Copenhagen Business School, and the Danish, uh, Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts, among others. Students and faculty throughout the University of Washington benefit from exchanges and scholarly celebrations with uh, our Danish colleagues at their institutions. These relationships with Denmark extend over many years and have deep roots at this university. And we share many of the same values, a commitment to the health of our population, to race and gender equity, and to social justice. With the generous support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and through our Population Health Initiative, for example, the university is working to create a world in which all people can live healthier and more fulfilling lives. We appreciate the efforts of the Gates Foundation, World Vision, the International Center for Research on Women, and other non-governmental organizations that work tirelessly to advance the issues of health, equity, and inclusiveness around the world. These are issues that are the focus of Her Royal Highness's work and of the panel discussion today. More than a century ago, the Washington State Legislature established a Department of Scandinavian Languages and Literature at the University of Washington. And classes in the Danish language instruction first were taught here in 1913, along with Norwegian and Swedish. Today, our Department of Scandinavian Studies also includes Finnish and Baltic studies, and is the leading program in North America uh, and the largest of its kind. The University of Washington is very grateful to the Danish government, and especially to the Ministry of Education and Research, for its continued and very generous financial support for a visiting lecturer of Danish at the University of Washington over the past 20 years. This position enhances our outreach to students and helps create a broader possibility of global perspectives. We know that Her Royal Highness embraces the value of learning a second language. She's a fluent speaker of Danish herself, not widely spoken in her native Australia. <laughs> we look forward to continuing our collaboration with Denmark to advance our common interests and priorities in education, in research, and global affairs. For many years, Her Royal Highness has been a passionate advocate for gender equality and the empowerment of women. She has worked tirelessly to improve the lives of the world's most vulnerable people, including adolescent girls and children. And thus, women's economic empowerment and gender equity equality will be the focus of a dynamic panel discussion today. 
Her Royal Highness's visit to the University of Washington has brought together leaders and experts on this topic who will inspire us and empower us all. Welcome, Your Royal Highness. Minister, Provost, Vice Provost, Ambassador, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And firstly, thank you for inviting me to attend this important high level uh, panel debate discussing women's economic empowerment. And thank you, uh, Provost, for your warm words of welcome. And yes, Danish is not often heard in Australia. <laughs> It's an honor to be here at the University of Washington and have the opportunity to hear the thoughts and reflections of a very knowledgeable and experienced panel on a very pressing issue. It is also a pleasure to see a larger group of students have also joined us today because the involvement and leadership of young people is absolutely essential to a prosperous modern economy that provides sustainable, inclusive growth. The topic of today's debate is central to all our efforts to achieve a more prosperous, peaceful and sustainable world. Equal opportunities for all and gender equality is, according to my conviction, one of the single most important things we can do to improve the world. It is essential for ensuring that men and women can contribute fully at home, at work and in the public life to the benefit of all our societies and economies at large. Gender, greater gender equality will provide some of the greatest opportunities of our time. It is so far from being just about women and for women. It is an issue that affects each and every one of us. It is a common agenda because we share a common vision or a common dream of a more just and equal world. And the world's adoption of the SDGs, including, of course, the gender dedicated goal five, clearly demonstrates our common goal, our common commitment and direction. Paving the way for greater gender equality depends on political dedication, public commitment and legislation. But it also takes knowledge and experience, best practices and inspiration if we are to fulfill the potential of every girl and boy, woman and man. But there is no easy solution. <laughs> Inequality is characterized by many complex and many different factors. In order to affect real change that we desire, I believe we have to have a greater focus on the role of social norms and unconscious biases and the barriers they present. For example, our social norms in many ways influence women's economic opportunities. They frame a woman's choice of education and career and they reflect and strengthen discriminating stereotypes which can affect equal pay and promotion. We need to become conscious of our unconscious biases and knowledgeable about the effect they have on our decision making. We know that gendered expectations are produced and reproduced from kindergarten to university, in families, on the street, as well as in the workplace. In too many countries, both boys and girls continue to make gender stereotypical choices of education, especially in science, technology, engineering and math, the so-called STEM subjects, where there exists a significant gender bias. Too few girls are pursuing an education or career in STEM. A 2015 survey, survey by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, showed that parents, to a lesser degree, expect their daughters to choose a technical or scientific education. It's time to challenge traditional attitudes and gendered expectations of boys and girls. As parents, 
educators, teachers, brothers, sisters, and mentors. It's about creating greater opportunities. It's about breaking down traditional expectations and opening up all opportunities to all boys and girls so they can choose freely. In the past five years, countries have made very little progress in reaching gender equality goals. Gender gaps continue to exist in all areas of social and economic life and across all so countries. Data tells us that lack of equality on a global scale means, amongst other things, harmful practices such as female genital mutilation are fostered, and every day 39,000 girls are forced into marriage. That 49 countries still lack laws that protect women from domestic violence, that only 23.7% of world parliamentarians are women, and only 8% are business leaders. And that although women work two-thirds of the world's workable hours, they only earn one-tenth of the world's income. And that 95% of heads of state are men. Clearly, much remains to be done to narrow and eventually close gender gaps worldwide. And clearly, we cannot continue just doing more of the same. Over the past year, I've had the opportunity to visit the OECD, an organization that in collaboration with other international organizations has a strong focus on gender equality and provides important data, information, and evidence-based analysis. In a recent survey, um, member countries identified three, uh, the three most important gender inequality issues in their country as violence against women, gender wage gap, and unequal sharing of unpaid work. I'd like to briefly focus on the first of these three. Violence against women represents the worst manifestation of gender inequality and remains a global pandemic. WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates that 35% of all women worldwide have experienced physical and or sexual intimate partner violence and or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. And disturbingly, public attitudes, also amongst women, continue to reflect an acceptance of domestic violence. Violence against women is not only a serious human rights violation, it also affects multiple areas of a woman's life, including their education, employment, income, social protection, justice, security, and health. We have to speed up progress on addressing this black spot on our development. Some good news. The OECD found addressing violence against women is a top priority for most OECD countries and government and stakeholders are increasingly strengthening legislation and conducting awareness raising campaigns aimed at preventing and ending violence against women. This strong action is what we need to be seeing on a global scale. Another important issue I would like to briefly touch on is the number of women in political and private sector leadership. Underrepresentation in leadership limits the presence of female voices and influence in important decisions. And it also deprives young women and girls of strong role models who can give life to their own dreams. We need to promote the visibility of female politicians and decision makers and create a safe and enabling environment in which they can participate in public life at all levels. And we need to el eliminate structural and legal obstacles that hinder women's full participation. The adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly the Gender Dedicated Goal 5, promises that by 2030, women and girls, even in the poorest areas of the world, should have the ability to enjoy their rights, fulfill their potential, and make their own life choices. As we all know, human progress doesn't just happen. 
we must ensure that the momentum and the will to act that led to the adoption of this global promise um, does not fade, but grows in strength and purpose. Data holds power. It tells us where we are and helps guide us to where we want to go. Through reliable data, women and girls' lives can become visible and counted, and that data can be used when engaging decision makers to accelerate efforts and in the development of policies, strategies, and, and programs. And of course, for measuring the much needed change. Now, I'm excited to hear the panel's views on the changes that is required, that are required, how we remove persistent barriers, and their thoughts on the solutions that need to be implemented to close the gender gap. I'm also looking forward to our Minister of Foreign Affairs sharing the Danish perspective on this issue. I'm very proud to come from a country with a successful gender equality track record, and a country that has been a long time champion for gender equality globally. Thank you to ICRW, World Vision, the University of Washington, and the Gates Foundation for presenting such an imminent panel on such a pressing global challenge. And to Sarah, um, CEO and President of ICRW, for leading the conversation that we're about to have. For far too long, we have struggled and we continue to struggle to remove the barriers preventing the transformation of the power held by women and girls into social and economic gains. Real change comes not only from strong leadership, legislation and enforcement, but also from challenging our mindsets, questioning our social norms and becoming aware of our unconscious biases. It requires the involvement of everyone as it is an issue that is important to everyone. We must ensure that no recommendation, no policy guidance, no solution is developed without taking into full account the outcomes for women and girls and the gains that can be derived from their empowerment. Focused and together we can achieve great progress. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Robert Stacy. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at UW, which is in turn home to the Department of Scandinavian Studies and our Danish Studies program. I'm pleased to welcome our panel moderator this morning, Dr. Sarah Degnan Kambu. Dr. Kambu is president of the International Center for Research on Women, a global research institute that focuses on realizing women's empowerment and gender equality to alleviate poverty worldwide. Sarah, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Stacy, and thank you, Your Royal Highness, for your very inspiring comments. We appreciate it. Can you hear me? Good morning, University of Washington. Hello. It is an honor for us to be here for this public event, to have an opportunity to co-host with the Department of Scandinavian Studies this conversation <coughs> on women's economic empowerment. Anybody out there from the Department of Scandinavian Studies? Yes, way to go. Thank you so much, thank you. So I think that um, Her Royal Highness has really done a tremendous job in helping us frame this discussion. And I loved her specific words that if we're looking for the global promise of a just and equal world, we must pay attention to the barriers that are keeping women and girls and other marginalized populations excluded from the economy. That this is where our promise of growth and justice lay. And so today, 
um, with the University of Washington. We've assembled a wonderful panel of experts who are going to share with you uh, this particular topic and dimensions of the work that they are doing through their organizations. I would say that for my own organization, the International Center for Research on Women, it was music to my ears when the Crown Princess says that we need data, that evidence, research evidence, and from our organization's perspective, evidence, not ideology, not intuition, should be driving policy, investment strategy, and the optimizing of programs intended to benefit the needs of women and girls and marginalized populations. Evidence gives us facts that can inform the way forward. So you will hear from our panelists the way that they are using their research, excavating under some of our common thoughts perhaps, some of the myths about women's economic empowerment and sharing with you how they are framing the way forward. And I am just delighted to turn the microphone over to Sarah Hendricks, who is representing the Gates Foundation. And Sarah, I'm gonna hand you this mic because we're gonna share. But you have all just launched a visionary gender equality strategy. And it has been a long time in the making. You've done so much thoughtful background work to, to frame the strategy. It would be very helpful if you could, as our first speaker, help people understand the kind of barriers that you feel are blocking women's full economic uh, uh, activity. And then how is uh, the foundation focusing its own intervention strategy moving forward? Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and for the wonderful remarks that have framed our discussion this morning. Um, as Sarah has just highlighted, the foundation um, certainly has launched our first ever strategy on gender equality. And this includes a $170 million commitment over the course of about four years, dedicated specifically on women's economic empowerment. And certainly, well, women and girls have long been at the heart of what the foundation does, notably in our work on issues such as nutrition, family planning, maternal, newborn, and child health. This is the first time we've put forward a specific strategy, really to, as you said, Sarah, to tackle the barriers that prevent women and girls from acting and from being equals to men in society and in economies. Um, research has, has shown us, and we've been diving into that research over the last year and a half, the ways in which poverty and inequality are so deeply intertwined and what that means for the lives of low-income women. And in too many places around the world, as we've just heard, women and girls still learn less and earn less have less access to economic and productive assets, and certainly wield less economic and social power than their husbands, their brothers, their male counterparts. We started thinking about what would happen if we flipped that narrative around. What would happen if we tackled directly some of the most prominent barriers that hold women back? What would happen if women and girls actually had access to income opportunities? actually had the financial tools to control their economic gain and had more voice and power in their lives in order to make decisions, uh, in order to have their voice fully included in their families, communities, in markets, and in economies. And so fundamentally, our strategy is looking at transforming the ways in which women participate in economies and recognizing that economic participation and economic power is one of the most profound ways that, that we actually wield and yield power in our own lives. And we see the, the research and the promise of research telling us that this matters not just for women's lives, but has tremendous promising effects for their families, for their communities, for society at large. And so this really has felt pretty much mission critical for us. Um, so where did we start this, this long-standing journey, as, as you called it, Sarah? Um, first, we wanted to take a really foundation-agnostic perspective on this. 
And as the Crown Princess highlighted, to really take a data-driven approach, recognizing how data holds power. And so consequently, we interviewed experts and dove into data in almost 100 economies around the world. And our research pointed to about 13 pivotal and promising factors or entry points that are most linked to women and girls overcoming economic barriers. And this surfaced for us a range of entry points and elements, from girls' education to the alleviation of unpaid care work, to tackling delayed marriage, to enhancing women's financial inclusion. And we recognize that all of these factors, all of these elements are pretty much very important. And so we also recognize that we couldn't focus on all of them at the same time. Consequently, we decided to apply a set of criteria in order to decide what we at the, at the Gates Foundation would start to work on. And this criteria that we layered onto this data and evidence um, generation looked at, number one, where we saw a near-term potential for impact. Number two, where we saw an opportunity that a foundation like ours is uniquely positioned to influence, where philanthropic capital could have a catalytic impact and could drive impactful change. And finally, where we already have assets and kind of muscle on the ground, where we already are working and where we potentially have um, existing experience and partners in play that we could build off of. Um, and where we might be able to be bold and take risks that, um, that others might, might not be able to. And so we decided to focus in essentially on three specific levers, on three specific entry points. The first one is on digital financial inclusion and on financial inclusion um, more broadly. And so here we're looking to work in a number of countries to ensure that about 63 million more women um, after four years are not only able to have access to a mobile money account, but are more equipped to become an active user of that account. And we believe that this will um, enhance women's capacity to become more active economic actors, um, to make their own decisions about savings, about spending, about taking financial risks, about becoming a financial actor and, and planning their own financial futures. The second area is in broadly what we call economic opportunity. And here we're looking at connecting women to decent market opportunities, specifically in the areas of agricultural markets, and looking to how this can expand women's profits as well as enhance women's value capture or income. Um, we're looking at building off of some of the most promising evidence that tells us, particularly in specific countries, what are the most effective interventions that will help the poorest women actually become connected to markets in meaningful, impactful ways. The third area that we are focused on is around support and connection between women. And here, we're looking at investing in, in what is called self-help groups. These are collective platforms where women connect in with each other, are able to support each other, are able to build up their economic power, as well as their voice um, in their own lives, in their families, and in their communities. Um, we're looking at creating a new generation of self-help groups from India to broader countries in Africa and expanding out the, the target segments of self-help groups to reach um, new groups of women, particularly younger women and adolescent girls, with skills and assets um, to be able to uh, have life skills to define their own economic futures and take bold steps that will transform their lives. We see these three areas very much building off of some of our existing work, notably in terms of um, some of the mutually reinforcing work that we have going on on improving access to family planning services, in terms of supporting grassroots women's movements and organizations, and also notably in terms of gendered data, recognizing, as the Crown Princess highlighted in her um, opening remarks, that data holds power and that we are 
continuing throughout all of this work to ensure that women's lives become counted and visible. Thank you so much. Um, so much really great information there. What an incredible vision, and we are very excited uh, about its recent launch. What I was really struck by is, of course, um, focusing on, uh, among your three components, the self-help groups. So this is really a, a bold investment because as development practitioners, we really do under, want to understand those collective platforms and their utility, their effectiveness, their impact. How can we scale them uh, to do even, even more good in communities? So thank you for your comments. We'll now move to Professor Sabine Lang here at the University of Washington. And I've asked her for a lightning round. Uh, in that she, as an expert in European political science, will talk about the women's machinery and national policies that are supporting women's economic empowerment. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me okay this way? Yes. Um, so if you want to bear with me for a moment, I would like to broaden our lens uh, in, a, in a mode that uh, Her Royal Highness has already uh, articulated. Uh, I would like to start with the fact that by this year, the past four years, eight European countries have or will be celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. And as we in those countries, Denmark among them, right, a 15, and as we celebrate uh, that suffrage, um, what we see in many European countries is what we now call a second women's revolution in the sense that we've realized suffrage is well, great, and we desperately needed it, and yet it is in and of itself maybe not sufficient. So in many European countries you have what we call a quota revolution. You have the insight that parties, that legislative bodies, that power in the governmental sectors won't easily be shared or shifted without state governing bodies administering some sort of quotas, either for parties or in legislative bodies. And as we reflect about that, I just want to make sure we understand how this emphasis on political governance and on economic governance correlates. Because in my view, if we don't get more women in governing bodies, there is lack of emphasis on all these issues that we're debating here today. There is lack of emphasis on dealing with corruption, dealing with democratization, dealing with health, education, and so on and so on. So this is where a nexus is that I think in many European countries we've identified, we have data about them, and we're in the process of addressing this, not as beautifully as Denmark has done, where you have without quotas amazing results, but in other European countries we need more government intervention here and we need international pressure to produce that government intervention. So that's one point where we maybe can discuss this intersection between government and the economy. Um, and in my two minutes here, I can now go to three ideas or three initiatives that I see to be quite prominent within the European context uh, and that I think would translate well into what we're discussing here um, for other continents and, and, and countries. The first one is quite obvious to all of us. It is childcare. It is the idea that you have to produce affordable childcare, affordable abilities for women to even enter a job market, to even enter a uh, non-governmental project. So Europeans in 2002 started initiatives through something called the, Bologna, uh, the, the Barcelona process that now makes sure that in most countries, 90% of children have affordable childcare between three and six, and about a third of um, children under the age of three are being taken care of. I think that's an important step for Europe and it should be an important step for the world, including my own country here. A second uh, initiative I'd like to quickly point out is 
um, translating what I mentioned about quotas to the private sector. There's in many European countries now initiatives to get more women on corporate boards. Um, the EU will be launching something within the next year, we think, in many other countries, Germany, France, uh, other countries, we have these initiatives. More women in high-level economic offices will again translate into more visions about what gender parity and gender balance means in society. So I think we can learn from that. And very quickly, my last point, a third in initiative that really translates into what my colleagues and peers here are working on, the so-called EU Spotlight Initiative of uh, this past year, where the EU has decided to give 500 million euros to combating violence against women in Africa, primarily also in Asia. Very important initiative that I think needs to be coordinated and will do a lot towards empowering women for more economic equity. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine, for a great lightning round. A couple things to pick up. She mentions quotas. You may know that the state of Iowa here in the United States actually has a quota for first level representative uh, government. And we have in the audience representatives of the state leg legislature of uh, Washington. So welcome this morning. I'm gonna skip, go directly to Sarah Gamage, who is my colleague at the International Center for Research on Women. She's a feminist economist. And I've given her a, a, a hard charge and to pick up on Sarah Hendricks, uh, you know, first comments here about uh, the barriers and key elements to support. And what are we picking up in our research, Sarah, that you'd like to bring to the audience's attention? Wonderful. Well, I'm going to tell a short story about someone I met in El Salvador in the late 1990s. Juana was a mother of three in a fishing village in the Gulf of Fonseca on the Pacific coast. And one day she discovered that her husband had unfortunately left her, taking the outboard motor, but leaving her with a boat and some tattered nets. So a deputation of friends came around to talk to her, to commiserate, to be supportive, and they said it could be worse. At least he left the boat and the nets. Now all you need is a man with an outboard motor. <laughs> and she thought about this, and she decided that she didn't need a man with an outboard motor. What she was going to do was to fish and she hadn't fished before. And so she fished in the estuary, and she took her children with her because they were very small, and she didn't have access to childcare. And she learned to fish, and she fished crabs and mollusks, and she got a very small catch, and she got very little money for it. But gradually, she became more adept at fishing, and she realized that she could actually hitch rides with some of the other fishermen out to sea, where she could get a bigger catch. And she went out again, and she tried again, and again, and sometimes she took her children, and sometimes the boat capsized, at least once with the children in it. But in the end, she began to fish sufficient amounts, and she began to get enough money by selling her fish that she was able to save for an outboard motor, a second-hand outboard motor. And she eventually saved enough that she could employ somebody else to fish for her, and she could buy a small drying rack and begin to dry her fish and process her fish. And gradually, she earned enough to make a difference in her life. What do we learn from this? I think we learn three very important lessons that we try to integrate every day in our work in ICRW. That social norms largely dictate who we are, what we do, and how we do it. But they are not immutable. They can be contested, and they can be altered. In this case, Juana chose to challenge the social norms that really she needed a male breadwinner. She decided to fish like a man herself, and it was not approved of by many members of the village, and she certainly faced significant discrimination. But she was aided by others who felt that she actually had the right to make a choice and not just sit around waiting for a man with an outboard motor to come along and support her. What else do we learn that I think is important that has been touched upon already in this panel? We learn that childcare, access to childcare is critical. Otherwise, women have to combine their reproductive lives, their caring work with their market work. And in this case, that placed Juana and her children at significant risk. So had there been care available, had there been some way that she could have left her children safely, she would have been less imperiled and they would have been less imperiled. We also learn that without savings or credit, 
um, that without access to a bank account, she had to borrow from moneylenders, she had to stick her money under the bed. It took a very long time for her to buy that outboard motor. And so had she had the opportunity to be financially included and banked, she may have had a very different trajectory to a much better livelihood um, outcome. So we focus on these three dimensions every day in our work in women's economic empowerment. Social norm change, addressing care needs and deficits as a critical barrier to women's economic empowerment, and linking women to markets and financial services. They are key pillars of our work. Thank you. Oh, well done. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'll give you a second bite of the apple so that you can come back and talk about unpaid care, okay? But over to Margaret Schuler um, from World Vision, sir. Come closer. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Margaret Schuler, who is Senior Vice President for the International Programs Group at World Vision, and we're coming to solutions. And they're doing some amazing work on the ground. And Margaret, would you tell us a little bit more about the Women's Economic Empowerment Programming, and if you could touch on Vision Fund, that would be fantastic. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and it's so wonderful to be here today. World Vision has been deeply engaged in work that ensures gender equity for decades. We currently operate in thousands of communities in nearly 100 countries. And we're led by our global strategy, which is called Our Promise 2030. We are reaching more than 200 million people every year through an integrated long-term approach that includes access to clean water, mother, newborn, and child health interventions, education, emergency relief, efforts to change deeply rooted cultural norms such as child marriage and gender-based gender violence, which we've already heard a little bit about today, and economic empowerment, which is foundational to everything that we do. There is one thing that is constant everywhere we work. When girls and women gain information, knowledge, and access to opportunity, they are empowered. And, it, and that's just a winning formula for, for the families, communities, and countries as a whole. We understand that women and girls are most definitely at the center of development, and that if we don't deliberately prioritize women in every aspect of our work, we will not achieve our mission. We have to keep, our, we have to keep a laser focus on SDG number five, which calls us to achieve gender equity and empower all women and girls. Frankly, it will be impossible to reach the other SDG goals without this. For example, World Vision's aim is to significantly contribute to the elimination of the most extreme forms of poverty around the world, SDG 1. And to do that, we must and we do focus on all aspects and all people, especially girls and women. World Vision works at both a system strengthening level as well as a community level to achieve results for women and girls. From a systems approach, World Vision works to engage communities, financial service providers, governments, and the private sector to promote a more enabling environment for women to succeed. We work with financial service providers and the private sector to include women more in financial services and markets. So at a community level, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the approaches that we use. There are just a few, but I wanted to highlight some of these that are most critical. We have a program model that's called Thrive, Transforming Household Resilience in Vulnerable Environments. This is World Vision's end-to-end -end economic empowerment model, which includes an understanding of a more empowered worldview for, for families and communities, training and education on the maximization of natural resource management and farm outputs, building resilience when environmental and natural risks happen, education about and access to financial services, and access to markets to make farms more than just subsistence, but businesses that can significantly increase people's incomes. The majority of people living in extreme poverty today are smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And the majority of these farmers are women. Last year, Vision Fund International, World Vision's microfinance arm, had 1.2 million client, clients, nearly three quarters of them women, and more than half of them farmers. Repayment rates were more than 98%. This is encouraging and powerful. 
One other component to this model is a savings group approach, which you've heard Sarah also talk about, uh, something similar. It's so simple, yet, as, yet it has such impact on women. As I've traveled around the world, I've seen so many women who felt hopeless find new pride and become truly empowered. Through these groups, women can increase their literacy, numeracy, and leadership skills. Strengthen, strengthen their social capital and resilience as they are now connected to a group and feel greater confidence from setting goals for themselves and achieving them. And these groups can also be an important step in linking them to formal financial services. Worldwide, World Vision has nearly half a million savers in savings groups. And you know, this is a, this is a really a good one. I, I, was in a, I was in Addis Ababa and I was, I was meeting with this woman in, in this household and she grabbed me and just hugged me and said, you know, I have seen so many things, I have done so much with other organizations and even with World Vision, but this, this savings group is the best thing that I've ever been involved in. Very simple, but very powerful. World Vision also uses a core project approach called Channels of Hope for Gender. With this approach, World Vision works with and through local faith leaders of all faiths and other community members to bring issues of gender inequality to, li to light, to challenge, to imagine, and to realize the success that can be achieved when men and women, boys and girls, work together for the benefit of their communities. This has proven to be a, a, a very effective approach because when those in leadership, secular and faith-based, come together with the same foundational understanding and goals for improving the lives of women, children, and families, behavior change is more rapid. So ensuring women's economic empowerment, it takes a multi-sectoral approach. So one of the things we work on is, is WASH, water and sanitation. World Vision is the largest non-governmental provider of clean water in the developing world. And the core component of our model is the formation of local water, sanitation, and hygiene committees, which collect small fees to pay for water point repairs as needed, an approach that helps ensure communities have the knowledge and financial resources to keep their water points functioning long term. And women are not only members of these committees, but often the leaders. Not to mention that every girl who can go to school and every woman who can put their abilities to productive work instead of spending their days walking for water makes us positive improvement in their lives and in the success of their communities. Finally, I'm running out of time. Finally, I just want to say that I'm so pleased that World Vision has joined with other NGOs to work for gender equality and women's empowerment. We are proud to be a part of the Coalition for Women's Economic Empowerment and Equality formed this year by NGOs and research institutions with an aim to promote women's economic empowerment and gender transformative policy making. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. Wasn't that amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the CWE uh, Coalition was founded by ICRW, uh, Human Rights Watch and CARE. And we are just delighted to have um, peer organizations joining that coalition because it's collection of voices, right? That's the collective power. And that's why self-help groups are important. That's why having village savings and loans associations are important. These become platforms uh, for women and girls as they move forward. So um, they've, they've taken uh, this wonderful loop uh, that they had um, as you were being seated. So this is, this is kind of the special treat of the panel, is that I get to introduce you to Guadalupe Tovar, who is a student here at the University of Washington, studying astronomy and astrobiology. And as I'm reading her bio, her, her focus is exoplanets. I had to Google it. I wasn't <laughs> sure what an exoplanet is. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear too much about exoplanets because we've asked her to focus on her journey. She is a first-generation college student. She's in this PhD program. She's entering a male-dominated field. We'd like to know what has that journey been, what has worked well, what do we need to do better so that more women come into um, these fields which are so important for our progress globally. So, Guadalupe, over to you. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me on this panel. It's definitely an honor and privilege to be here with you all. And I'm really excited to share this, uh, this stage with so many great people on the, plan on the panel. And today, as the only student on this panel, I first want to acknowledge and recognize that the story, my story that I will be sharing with you all today, might not be representative of the journey that every student here has at the UW, but I hope that in sharing my story, maybe bits and pieces will resonate with people in the audience, um, and if not, inspire you to take a, a point of action in, in this larger topic that we're talking about today. So I'll start off uh, by saying that if you would have asked me in high school and you would have told me, you know, today, Lupita, you would be a PhD student in astronomy and astrobiology, I think I would have laughed because I would have never seen myself um, in that position. I come from a migrant farm working background. I am first generation, and I'm proud to be a first generation college. My parents migrated to the United States in the early 90s from Mexico and didn't get the opportunity to continue their education because they wanted to provide for their family. So we talked a little bit, of, was mentioned in the panel about social norms. The social norm for me was not to go to college. So in high school, I didn't have thoughts of, of going to college. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year that I decided that I would apply to a university. Now fast forward, when I got to the University of Washington specifically, I didn't know that you could pursue a career in STEM, specifically in astronomy or physics. And so I came in with the idea that I would study business, um, and I was really excited. And it wasn't until I was exposed to research on campus that I started to learn that you could be an astronomer, that you could study physics. And so I was really excited. I really jumped on board and took opportunities, research opportunities here on campus. And that was really exciting. And I followed that career. But it wasn't smooth sailing. Because when I would go to classes, specifically when I would go to physics classes, I would find myself counting how many women were in the room. And oftentimes, the numbers, most of the time, were very small. Add on another layer, if, you, if I counted the number of women of color in the room, there was one too many times where I was the only one. Now, if you ask how many of the students in that classroom, how many women in that classroom were first generation, you start to see that we get to this funnel and th the numbers start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So how could I have this spark of so much excitement for this field, but when I walked into a classroom, there was no representation. I didn't see myself in that classroom. I didn't see myself as someone who could be an astronomer. It wasn't until I met another woman of, of color that was doing astronomy that finally, for the first time, I could see someone who looked like me thriving in this field, and that's powerful. I think that's the first, the first thing to, to mention is that representation does matter in this field, and it's not until you can see someone who looks like you or shares a similar story to you that you start to picture yourself in those same spaces. And when we start to talk about, you know, how do we improve this pipeline for women um, in STEM, how do we encourage them? I think that women have a lot of brilliance and have the capability to be in these spaces. They're curious, they have questions. We are interested in STEM. I don't think that that's the problem. I think the problem is that we don't have a seat at the table oftentimes in these STEM fields. So rather than focusing on how do we get more women into these STEM careers, I would challenge you all to think about the question, how do we amplify the voices of the women that are already in those spaces, succeeding in these fields? How do we amplify their voices and their work? And to do this, I think that first, we need to learn to pass the mic. Because if you have these women who are already in these fields, it's a simple solution. Pass the mic. If you have a mic, let those people tell their stories. You will learn, the community will grow, the field in, at large will advance more. You will have more ideas that were brought to the table. And I think that enhances the field greatly. Now, if you look at the, uh, the flip side of things for the people who are in positions of power and privilege who are starting up new programs, um, to focus on women empowerment. I think that is wonderful that there are many um, organizations that are doing this. Um, the question that I often find myself asking with these organizations who are 
um, putting together these plan panels is who is at the table? Does everybody have a seat at the table? When you say you're focusing on women empowerment, are there women at that table? Are there women of color at that table? Are there people from different gender identities from LGBTQ communities um, also represented at those tables? So I will conclude by leaving you with these three, three points um, in talking about women in STEM. The first being, again, that representation matters. Being able to see someone who looks like you and shares a similar story or walk of life is crucial to maintaining those people, maintaining women. It's the reason I stayed in this field um, moving forward. For the people in terms of what do we do next, how do we improve um, the STEM pipeline for women, I think we need to take a look around and see who has a seat at the table. If someone is missing a seat and you're in a position of power or privilege, I encourage you to maybe give up your seat. Pass that mic. Make sure that the voices that you are trying to amplify are actually represented at the early starts of whatever program um, you are trying to create from the start. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you so much for your time. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I want to take um, two seconds to let you know that there are mics on either side of the aisles. Uh, we will have two final lightning rounds, and then we will open it up for Q&A if you'd like to ask the panelists any questions. We've got um, a very tight schedule. We'll probably be able to take four questions, but if you're interested in asking a question, I suggest that you uh, line up behind the mics. While you're doing that, Next lightning round goes to Sarah Gamage, who will talk to us about the recognition, reduction, and redistribution of unpaid care work. Wonderful, thank you. Well, let's just start with care is essential for the young, the sick, and the elderly. And at some time in our lives, we have all needed and will need care. And let's frame it in a rights framework the right to care and be cared for. Because if that is our lodestar, we can begin to think about some of those solutions. And I would say that at ICRW, we focus on the three R's, recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care. The goal is to develop health systems, education, social protection systems that support caring without penalty either for those who receive the care or for those who may choose to enter the labor market. You want to be able to ensure that you can work and care when you wish to and in the amount that you wish to. That would be a gold standard for a more gender equal society. So recognizing unpaid care means recognizing that we do this, that it is in fact a tremendous subsidy to the functioning of our economic systems. And recognizing can take place in many different ways. Recognizing that it is work. We've seen many countries change the way they credit people with their pensions. If you spend time caring, we will credit you for a certain amount in your pension. This is a tremendously positive way to resolve some of the gender inequalities that we see. Because if you gain a, a pension because of your attachment to the labor market, if you are out of the labor market caring, then you do not usually gain a pension. You do not end up with a pension. So Chile decided in 2006, when they <coughs> redid their pension system, that they were going to credit people for caring, for time spent and caring for others. Sweden as well, they have a system where you're credited with a basic minimum for the time each year that you spend caring for children, the sick, or the aged. Now another way to recognize um, is also collecting time use data so that we can begin to put it in our national accounts. We can begin to understand that distribution, the gender distribution. Reduction, well, I would say we need to invest in care services, but we need to think of them as an investment, not as some recurrent expenditure. And we have some great examples where investing in care actually dynamizes the labor market. It generates about 2.5 more jobs for, for each dollar or pound or euro invested in care. And those jobs tend to go to women, but those jobs also tend to be more formal when this has been done through a centralized system. So these are two ways to do it. In terms of redistribution, let's think more about the kinds of policies and programs that redistribute between men and women, between the market and the state. So parental leave, that's a wonderful way to begin to challenge gender norms and accord men the right to care as well. Thank you. Oh, great lightning round, well done. <laughs> Sabine, last word. 
Can it be a sentence or two? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That would be <laughs> lovely. Um, I'm going to just go off what, what Sarah has started with and what we've, I think, now heard from all the panelists, and uh, that is data matters. I heard it in two different ways that I think um, should really guide part of this conversation here. One way is that data matters in the sense that we need to know more about how gender impacts not just women, but also men, relationships, economic situations in countries that um, in one way or another have to do with what in the old days in Europe we called gender mainstreaming, now we call it gender impact assessments. The understanding that whatever policy you're dealing with, it is crucial to understand its impact on gender. Um, that would be a data-driven approach that I would wish we would take way more seriously than we do now. And it is something that I would also for all the students here in the room, think is a pretty interesting and fruitful pro professional um, trajectory to embark on. Um, I think here, for example, is where university, NGOs, governments are coming together and producing knowledge that we really need for this future. And very quickly, a second point, uh, about data-driven is numbers. What Guadalupe told us about the sheer uh, necessity of numbers of who you are being in a room to make you um, trust in yourself and trust in a given career. I think is also something we need to have more numbers and this brings me back to, for me, the quota for other people, many other things. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. I see that we have some folks lined up, which is just terrific. So may we invite you, please, to the microphone? And would you tell us your name and how you're associated with today's event? And please ask a question. If you'd like to direct, uh, direct it to one of the panelists, that's fine, or just generally. OK, for sure. So I'm Sarah Rose. I'm double majoring in education and European studies. I actually have Professor Ling now, so that's how I learned about it. Uh, my question is, so Guadalupe, you mentioned the importance of women having a seat at the table. Well, how do we encourage men to pass the mic and give up that seat? Because I feel like once you have that power, it's very hard to give it up or people wouldn't want to do that. So this question, whoever wants to answer it, I guess. Very nice. Thank you so much, our fourth Sarah today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take four questions in a row, and then we'll go right back to answers. Who on this side? Hi. Hey. Um, my name is Katerina Lindbergh, and I just want to ask, um, how can I, I have a 40, 40 hour work week, um, how can I engage in more? Is there small things that we can do? Uh, I have three kids and a husband and don't really have time to, to dig in much, but um, anything, any suggestions? I was looking through uh, this pamphlet that was outside, but um, there's a lot of research on it, I understand, but anything here that we can dot down and say, oh, okay, $25 here or, um, anything. Thank you. Thank you. Madam. My name is Nina Peterson, and I'm a good friend of the Danes, and I'm a good friend of Marianne Stecker, who encouraged my t us, me and my husband to come to this meeting. I have a specific case to mention. Five years ago, my husband and I, during a, a safari to Kenya, met Brenda. Brenda was a local girl doing nails in a little shop in Nairobi. Uh, she's a Maasai girl from a small community in southern Kenya, and we decided to invest in Brenda. So we did. We helped her set up a shop in uh, Louis Tokotok is where she's from. She did extremely well. She became very successful in business. She became a pioneer for the other women in her community. Then Brenda married a doctor. And so now she's also involved in women's health issues, in particular the cut, which I'm sure you heard about the female mutilation uh, issue. So now here we have Brenda five years later. She's a, a leader in her community. She's been doing things for the local Maasai women, uh, organizing them. But now we're at the point where there are a lot of Brendas out there, and there's not much more we can do but so how do your organizations come from the top to the bottom and how does she get in touch with you 
in the top. And I think there's a lot of potential there because these women are amazing and what they go through, the pain and the struggle and how they survive, we need to use them. That's my question. Amazing, their amazing resilience. Thank you, Nina. We'll have the panel address that. Is that the last question? So, um, well, let's first uh, address Sarah's question, Guadalupe. How do we get women to pass the mic, let go of the power? Men. Well, women and men, I thought mm -hmm. I heard. Okay. Over to you. Yeah. That's a really great question. Um, and I think to answer that question, I'll speak broadly to this audience. Again, if you're in a position of power or privilege at that table, and you're seeing that certain people in that, at that table are not learning to pass the mic, I challenge you to be the person who speaks up, say something. If you're also sit, sitting at that table, I challenge you to give up that, that chair at that table so that someone else um, can have the opportunity to speak up. And the question specifically was, how do you get men to pass the mic? So I, I guess I wanna more specifically address the men in the audience and in general, um, men, take a look at the, the tables that you're sitting at. Do all of the people around the table look just like you? If so, ask yourself why. And ask yourself if someone, that person maybe even, it starts with you, if you think someone else can have that seat at that table. So it's uncomfortable, right? You don't wanna lose your position of power. That's, that's understandable. But we, in order to move forward, it starts with um, individual people learning to speak up and learning to you know, say, this is not my seat at that table. I wanna give opportunity to someone else. So I challenge you to either be that person yourself or if you see um, people who have the opportunity to, to give up a seat, or maybe even add a seat to that table, be that person who speaks up. Because it starts, um, it starts with the individual. Thank you so much. And I was gonna say women too, because sometimes women hold on to power. So we, we, we can address both of those issues. Um, this wonderful question, what can I do? I'm inspired, I'm ready to do something. What can I do? I'm a, you know, very busy person and dealing with lots of different things. How would the panel, who on the panel would like to field that question? Yes, Sarah. Well, I would say speak up in your community. If you can vote, vote. If you can make claims on the duty bearers around you, the authorities around you, demand things of them. Demand things like childcare, demand things like much more family-friendly policies in the workplace. Demand things like quotas and temporary special measures to ensure that there are more women on electoral tickets. You have a voice. And I am sure you have many opportunities and many platforms in your communities through your schools to really project that voice. So I would begin there. And that really is something that is so powerful because you will then lead and lead by example. Thank you. I just want to say that I've been doing this work for 35 years and I was incredibly re-energized by the Women's March and also the March for Our Lives watching citizens engage on issues and raise their collective voice is just a very powerful, impactful um, opportunity. And it doesn't need to be hundreds of thousands, it can be hundreds. But um, just that collective action is, is amazing. And, and I, so I love the idea of voice. And um, Nina's wonderful story of the Brendas of the world and the work that you've done uh, with, uh, with Brenda in, in Nairobi, in Kenya. Um, thoughts, Margaret, yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that story. <clears throat> I've also spent a lot of time in Kenya and actually have spent time in, um, in the Maasai areas in West Pokot and other places in the country. And, you know, these issues, uh, things like uh, female, female genital mutilation, uh, early child marriage, these are critical issues. And, you know, what it takes is, is real... Um, an end-to-end -end approach really is what it takes. So you're working at community levels to change norms, to change behaviors, but you're also working at policy levels. So one thing that um, World Vision and other organizations are doing is working through the African and with the African Union, a higher level body that sets policies and then works with member countries to drive those policies forward. So it's nice to do the community-based work, but if you want policy change and you want, um, 
you know, real change across countries and, and, and laws to be changed, then I think it's important to work with these higher level um, entities. And um, I think for things like child marriage, it's, it's making a difference. Um, you, see, you see just kind of this, this whole body of, of, of higher level policymakers, NGOs, uh, different entities, focusing on that effort intentionally, and I think change is being made. So, you know, that's really what it takes is, is intentionality and different levels of, of work. Thanks, Margaret. Last word to you. Sure, I just wanted to add to that last question. Um, your question, and thank you for bringing to life the, the story of, of Brenda and the way in which you and your husband have so thoughtfully and intentionally invested into her transformative opportunities that, um, that she now has in her life. I, I wanted to, you, you asked a question about top to bottom, and I wanted to draw our attention to the role that donor organizations as well as governments have to directly support women's movements and local organizations. Um, this is something that the Gates Foundation has been not just looking into, but actually trying to put money behind over the last year. And here I see the important role of uh, institutions to invest in local women's movements and organizations with funding that is predictable, with funding that can be sustained, and with funding that supports women to define their own priorities and to engage in actions about the things that matter to them. Secondly, I think there's a role beyond just funding. There's a role to open up the political space for Brenda's voice to actually be heard. For Brenda and her colleagues to actually have a voice, whether it's at the African Union, whether it's at the United Nations, whether it's within the deliberations by her own community governance mechanisms or within the national um, deliberations of the Kenyan government itself. I think there's an exciting role to support local women's movements and organizations that, that all of us could, could take advantage of and could look into in intentional ways. Thank you so much. Well, that is um, unfortunately the end of our time, and I would like to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for their comments today, Guadalupe Tovar, Sarah Gamich, Margaret Schuler, Sabim Lang, and Sarah Hendricks. And now I have the honor of inviting the minister uh, to please give closing remarks. Thank you so much. Yeah. I feel a little bit marginalized today. <laughs> Being a man, 50 years old, gray hair, and in power. <laughs> and I'm not going to step down voluntarily. <laughs> and one of the reasons why is, in fact, the personal story that I would like to invite you to, to listen to. Um, I used to be a member of a social liberal party in Denmark. It's a very uh, strong party in Denmark. It's not a big party, but it's, uh, it's been central to what's power for many, many years. And they have a long history of having strong women uh, in front. Uh, and, and one day I simply had to recognize that if I was ever going to be leader of a party, it, I had to start my own party. <laughs> and I think that's, that's, that's a story of where Denmark is in many ways today, even though we haven't solved all problems, not at all, not at all. But we have a long uh, tradition of uh, having an, an attitude towards gender equality that is hopefully uh, something to look up to um, for the rest of the world. I think uh, uh, one of the, 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 co uh, the core reasons for that is in fact the Queen and Her Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Princess of Denmark, Mary. Um, we have a long tradition of, of strong women in central positions that we look up to, and that we do not, in fact, look up to as women, but as human beings. Uh, and this goes 50 years back, or 100 years back, uh, and I think this is one thing that is very, very uh, important to remember. Now, I started then my own party, uh, that was, tough job, uh, 
there was a collapse and then up again and a collapse again and up again and another collapse. And now, one, one and a half years ago, we entered government with six ministers, in fact. Uh, three of them women, including my bigger sister. <laughs> I didn't dare go join a government without her. <laughs> She's much more clever than I. Two, uh, two, two, uh, two universities degree and uh, she has been uh, women, business women of the year and everything else. So I just had to have her on board also. Um, I think that uh, it's important uh, to mention, to underline that in Denmark we believe that gender equality and equal opportunities and women's enjoyment of human rights is the right way and the right thing to strive for. It is part of a parcel and parcel of the promises of the Sustainable Development Goals. And as was demonstrated also again here today, it's not only the right thing to work for, it is also the right, the wise thing to do. Just one number to underline that. Global GDP will increase by 25% if women were given the same rights and opportunities in the sphere of work as men, everyone stands to gain. It is indeed a precondition for delivering on the SDG promises by 2013. 13. We know that in far too many places in the world, girls and women do not have the possibility to enjoy their rights, fulfill their potential, and make their own choices in life. That is why Denmark's foreign policy strategy emphasizes the Danish commitment to work through many strings and in partnerships with range of actors to change these injustices. Only through partnerships and by implementing a whole of society approach in our work for female empowerment, we can break down the barriers and advance gender equality. You mentioned, the Crown Princess of Denmark mentioned that we have also to look at data. And I really buy into that. And that goes also, that's also because if we look at data, it's also a kind of promising. Because we have to remember where are we in fact. When people are asked, how many girls do you think proportion of girls in low-income countries that actually fulfill the basic education system, goes through the basic education system, and people are asked 20%, 40%, 60%, a majority says 20%. The right answer is 60%. So things are moving forward. And you also underlined that this is one of the, the basic, very, very important things education. In Denmark, we participate shoulder by shoulder with US in Afghanistan. We lost 43 lives in Afghanistan. And sometimes we have a debate in Denmark whether it gives any sense to join in a war so far away from Denmark. But then again, look at the data. When we entered Afghanistan in 2001, 1% of the girls enter school and had the opportunity to have a basic education. Today, even though we still have so much to work for and, 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 and to deliver on in Afghanistan, the figure is 47%. We tend to forget that things move forward. We'll have to work even closer together in the coming years to deliver and to secure gender equality we need it, all of us. Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Reedinger, the Vice Provost for Global Affairs here at the University of Washington. It's been an extraordinary morning. Um, on behalf of the University of Washington President Anamari Kause, I want to thank Her Royal Highness, thank the panelists, Thank Mr. Minister, but I'm also gonna take prerogative of having the microphone, knowing I should pass it, so I will use it to acknowledge that on behalf of my mother, who celebrated her 86th birthday yesterday, 
on behalf of my wife, on behalf of my daughter, and on behalf of my two and a half year old granddaughter, thank all of you for the extraordinary work that you're engaged in. And on my own behalf, thank you for all that you're doing. I wanna thank the Embassy of Denmark, the Department of Scandinavian Studies for sponsoring this event. And I wanna thank the audience for attending the event. And now I have one request of that audience. Please remain seated while Her Royal Highness and the other members of the panel uh, exit the room. I will let you know as soon as we're ready for you to depart.